Here's Bob. Okay. Here's Bob and Johnny. Yeah. Johnny. Rob Taylor and Diane. There's Ernie. Do you see Ernie? <laughs> Ernie here. There we go. Hi! Hello! <laughs> oh, Thanks, Mr. Oh, no. Hello! <laughs> oh, I love to see you. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Lovely right. to see you both. Good. I wish you were here, morning, everybody. Good morning. We are so excited for this very special event this morning, and we have so many friends on the line now. We've we've admitted you to the call all on mute, and so uh, we've done that just so that people aren't trying to talk over each other or. Um, uh, Everybody can hear Sister Ethel and the story she's going to tell. We are just over, over the moon, overjoyed to have this time today. Um, we have exactly one hour with Sister Ethel and um, we, will, uh, we will keep it to that. We won't run over because um, we need to make sure that uh, it, the sun doesn't set in South Africa before we're through with this call. So. Uh, my name is Sue Remus, and I am the co-founder of Missionville USA, and I currently serve as the secretary of the board of directors for Missionville USA. And I am really happy to introduce our other board of directors, um, all of whom, with the exception of one, have been with us from the very beginning of Missionville USA in 2012. Um, so we have Becky Martin is on with us. Becky, if you could just give a little wave. Thank you, Becky. Becky was such an inspiration when we were uh, having just the idea to begin Missionville USA and really gave Jen and I the kick that we needed to get it going. So happy to have Becky with us. Dan Gensler is here. Dan has been uh, also a founder member of the board of directors and has been our treasurer for all of those years. And anybody who knows Dan knows exactly why that is. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Worthington is with us. Ben also with us from the very beginning, 2012. Ben is our vice president of the board of directors currently. And where is Mary? Where is Mary Griffin? I don't see her on the There she is. Mary Griffin, we're delighted to welcome Mary to our board of directors just this year. So, so happy that she has joined us. And then, of course, our co-founder and president of the board, Jen Ludlam. So just invite Jen to say a few words before we get started. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for the years of your generosity and taking this trip with us, uh, supporting Sister Ethel and everyone at Mission Bell. We just greatly appreciate all that you do and the kind emails that you send back. And now it's so wonderful to actually put the faces to the email and I've spoken on the phone with a couple, but to see you is fantastic. So thank you for joining us this morning. Um, just, I'm just gonna give just a quick update just to kind of let you know. This year so far, even though it's been a very difficult year for many, uh, we have raised already $29,000. And with that, we have sent over just over 27,000 of it just because of the dire need and what the care center needs this year. Um, so that just to give you a quick update where we are and I'm gonna pass it on to back to Sue. Thank you, Jen. So just as Jen mentioned, we know that this has been a uniquely challenging year for everybody, no matter where in the world you may be. Um, and when we experience challenges, it's very likely that those are amplified and multiplied uh, for our friends in Mission Vale. And so we wanted to have this opportunity to let Sister Ethel share with you what, what is happening at the care center, what is happening in the community of Mission Vale and how the care center is modifying some of its services to continue to care for the people of Mission Vale with love and dignity and be a, that glimmer of hope in a very dark time. So I know you didn't come on to hear me talk, so we will, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I built it up there and now. <laughs> if you have questions, we're gonna ask Sister Ethel to just share, um, share her perspectives and share her stories. 
uh, and then take questions at the end if there if there's time for questions. If you do have a question, if you could please type it in the chat box for us and or pre press the little raise your hand feature. And um, again, if we have time for those questions, we will certainly be happy to get to them. Now, without further ado, we've got to find, uh, Linda, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I can. There we go. Okay, <laughs> Sister Ethel, welcome and thank you very much for taking this time to be with us this morning. Well, I am delighted to be here, but there's sadness in my heart too. Um, people I'm looking at right now have been here in the boardroom having a, and have had cups of tea with Linda and I. How much I would love if that could be possible now. I'm not very good at um, this virtual thing. It's new to me. I love to hug people and I love to sit down with them and to be close with them. So this is all a new experience to me. So I have to use my imagination that you're here across the table or beside me like Linda is. And you know, uh, Jen coming out with that phenomenal amount of money, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Um, you know, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said one time that the world hungers for goodness and when we recognize it, we applaud it. So I applaud it from deep in my heart what you have done and what you have made possible for us here in Mission Bay. I, am, I had the privilege of working with Jen here for many, many months. And um, she's the gentlest and kindest person, but she can be a bit of a nagger. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that she has nagged you for money. And you know, you really are in for it now because she'll soon be in for hope for the holidays. <laughs> so she won't let go. <laughs> but at the back of it all, you can't believe that she's like that when you really meet her in person. You know, and I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity at meetings when she does this. You know, <laughs> you're in for your first written warning if you don't give it. <laughs> so thank you so, so much for your great generosity that comes from great hearts. And I know that Linda has, would be saying the same. Yeah. So thank you for that and for... You know, um, I think more than ever, this pandemic, um, I know certainly it has taught me, has grounded this in me, that it's not you and us, but that we are all in everything, every facet of life together now. You know, it's like, um, you know, that great poem of um, Maya Angelou, when great trees fall, but when one tree falls, the whole wood is rocketed. And I, I do feel that more than ever during this pandemic, that that's a reality for us. Like, um, I'm sure there's none of you who don't know somebody who has died of the virus. Like right now here in Mission Vale, we have 208 people infected by the virus. You know, um, I would say myself, you know, living here, that um, they don't have exotic isolation. And you'd say, um, you know, uh, from your visits here, Dan and Bob, and you know, you would know yourself, isolation in a shack. What is that? We're all into social distancing during the day. And then when you say once the sun sets, everybody is on top of each other in a two bedded room house. So like it doesn't make sense and yet we ourselves are mind boggled that you know it hasn't wiped us out. And I have been asked many times over the past six months um, like you know how is it that you don't have more deaths? We only have had one that has been admitted to. The, um, the 
the virus kind of has a stigma attached to it, very much like the HIV and the AIDS. And when you ask anybody, you know, what did such a person die of? They'll say the blood pressure or the chest. It's usually one or two of those things. But it's just simply, um, they don't want to admit it because of this stigma. Like um, the other day, I met this man and a friend of his past, a, a lady, and um, he said to her, um, uh, no, sorry, she said to him, where have you been these past six weeks? Were you with Corona? <laughs> so Corona is no longer a virus, it's a person, you know, here. And people joke about it. But as you know, it's no joke. And um, Linda and I have spoken about this several times. How is it that we are not absolutely infested with it? Because of, like, we lack what the rest of us safeguard. You know, we're great with the, um, the sanita sanit sanitization. But when you have to wash your hands in water that's standing for two days, you know, how many, it's full of bacteria. Like today in Missionville, we have no water. We had none yesterday. We had none Friday and Thursday. We're promised that this evening it will come back. And I'm telling you, we're waiting for it like Father Christmas. We're hoping it will. But then the social distancing is absolutely out for us only during the day here at the care center. Tomorrow we go, well at midnight tonight, we go down to level one. And um, that already has been, I've been told that the president has already said the virus is gone, simply because we're going down to level one. A lot of people have discarded with their masks and um, it is a big threat to us. I see Mel there, but I don't know how he feels about it. But I would like to see us on level two for quite a few more months because we need that safeguard. Our safeguard here in Missionville, as I said, Linda and I talk about it, and I would, I would attribute it to two things. And that would be prayer, the circle of God's protection around people. And the second one would be that, you know, down all the years, I've spent 33 years of it here, of my life here, that I mean, being exposed to so much bacteria, so much illnesses, that we do believe that people have built their own immunity. Now, it's not something I would write down, but yet it's a belief in my heart and I should be able to write it down. But I've no hesitation in saying it to people, that somehow they have built their own immunity. So like, um, it's protecting them, building their immune system. You know, the medication is there. We all know about the vitamin C it has to be taken with the vitamin D and the zinc. It has to be taken separately. But those are all, you know, hugely expensive treatments and we can only get them in the multivitamin with a less percentage. But like everything in life, you work with what you have and what is possible. And um, I'm very aware of Brookie here now too, a doctor. And maybe she could write out all that thing that's all nonsense. But it's our belief, it's working for us. And I do believe God's protection around everybody is the strongest barrier beyond any medication. So um, with the, the money that, that Jen has sent through to us, it has been a fabulous emergency pocket for us that we've been able to um, give more of we know the nutritious food to the people. And we're able to reach so many more. But like that again, it's going into the future, it's a food provision for them. We have a fabulous uh, community garden here and um, it's working so well and it's really so luscious simply because we have a farm of um, tanks. And so the water that comes off the buildings or irrigates the, the vegetables. But we have initiated now um, a program called um, uh, Gardens of Faithfulness. And they'll be roughly about maybe two meters wide and one meter long. And every person will get a packet of seeds 
and um, they ha themselves have to get, we'll say, three packets of um, blankets, you know, just rushes and anything, even if it's weeds for now, and then a little packet of ash. And um, our caregivers will be trained in the program as well. And as they go out, they'll be able, you know, to um, encourage the people and plan with them. And at least, you know, it will be some provision. Um, you know, we always have to kind of strike a balance between compassion and bringing out the potential of people. And we don't want to deprive them of that. We want them to realize what they are capable of and what the provision they can make. You know, since the, um, the pandemic has hit us, um, we have a, a wonderful lady in the Crafter Center called Manisha, and she has made masks, thousands of them, for everybody here in Mission Vale, and we're selling them. Linda, how much have we made now? Oh, the profits. Yeah. I'd say we've every month roughly we've we've made at least between five and ten thousand rand on on the masks, um, and we had a few in the beginning of lockdown, especially the orders were much larger. There was one that came to about sixty thousand rand, so this is the highest that our crafters unit has ever produced for themselves. Um, and so now what they do is a portion of each mask sold goes into the fund to produce masks then for free distribution to people here because we do have. A lot of people that show up here either without a mask completely or with something inappropriate, a scarf that has a hole in it or something that's not quite safe. Yeah. So, um, like, I would definitely say, like, I know during this silent period that it has done a lot of good in bringing out the potential in people. And I, have, I live up the hill and I've been working for home, from home. And um, I take care of about roughly 30 families a week, you know, intensely. I've got to know them much better through their writing little notes to me and I writing back to them. And uh, so it has been. And I have started this uh, with uh, six women baking their own bread, you know. And again, it's food provision for them. And they're teaching their neighbors. And I said, now, don't be teaching old ladies like me. You must teach the young ones, you know, and um, they're, they're getting great success. And I think it's giving them great encouragement themselves, what they're doing. So I'm like the Shibin Queen now, buying the yeast for the, for the bread. <laughs> and uh, there's a supermarket like where I do get it. And there's this guy there and he's very funny. And he, you know, he does know the Shibin Queens. And when he sees me, he says, come, 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 you know, and he pulls out a big box. I buy it in bulk. And he says, come, come, come. He says, like, I have yours. And one day, I was beside this should be in Queen. And he said, you know, Sister Ethel has ordered this. And she turned over and she wanted my recipe, how to make beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, like, it, it's amazing, like, what you do when you have, no, you have nothing. And, like, um, you you. I suppose it's kind of a contemplative time when you really come to realize how um, the wonder that's in everybody. And not, no poverty can steal that. You know, dignity is a, a wonderful thing. And, you know, like naturally, um, you know, when we see somebody in tattered uh, clothes, now we can't say tattered shoes anymore, Dan, because of Tom's shoes, but, um, you know, I don't know. I can, I often see people, you know, judging them and um, I kind of, just because you don't have nice clothes and, you're, you know, your hair isn't combed or whatever, whatever, you know, they think that that's the potential of the person and my goodness, how wrong they are. I think the greatest people I know in my own life, the greatest teachers in my life have been the poor. And um, there's, um, they have given me a wisdom maybe that I can't verbalize. And, um, and sometimes it's so profound, I'm not able to speak about it. You, know, you don't find it in books. 
but standing shoulder to shoulder with them and listening to their stories, you know, which is an expression of their own souls and hearts, then you learn it. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you just think of this now, this time last year, did any of us ever think that we would be having, that all meetings would be now, you know, virtual meetings? We have a trust meeting coming up one of the days now. And I said, you know, the greatest thing about a trust meeting was, you know, again, coming together as people. And, um, you know, you, you can no longer read the body language. And I think that tells a lot. But um, like now it's just going to be kind of say, you, you, you sit straight. And I find myself now, even with you leaning out, I want to welcome you and I can't, <laughs> I just can't, you know. So yeah, it's very difficult. I'm not used to this. Um, Linda is the guru on technology, oh, but um, yeah. Once I have the email, and thank you so much for the emails I get and the concern you expressed through them. I really appreciate it. It's, it lifts me up. You know, naturally myself, um, I haven't found the lockdown easy. Um, live alone. And, you know, I'm 48 years now in South Africa. And for most of the years I was in Pretoria, um, you know, it was wonderful. I had fabulous support because, um, you know, where the, the young men that were studying to become priests. And um, I was their, um, say, the person who used to take responsibility for their pastoral training. So I had them then every Monday morning, every Saturday morning and every afternoon. And um, commitment and zeal and joy would be very, very important to me in my own life. And I do feel that anyone who has given their life to God should be full of it. But anyway, they tell this joke about me, against me, saying that I used to say to them before their ordination, you know, unless you're zealous now, loving and kind and compassionate, it's not the oil on the day of your ordination that will make you that. You have to be that now. But they in turn were wonderful to me. The support I got from them and um, we had more sisters of my age then. I was only 27, 28, you know, was very involved in the apartheid movement. And, um, you know, I had boundless energy, which I'm so grateful for. Now, again, with the lockdown, it made me realize how my energy has diminished. And things that would take me an hour to do might take me two and a half hours to do. And I get annoyed with my physical ability not measuring up my head and my heart and that's very hard to accept so this lockdown has really taught me quite a few things yeah i don't know what your experience of it was like i didn't meet anybody for about three months and then in the past three months linda and i have had five meetings and uh, that has been lovely she's a lovely person and it's so lovely to be with her and um you know, to have the meetings and to plan for Mission Bay, because naturally, a girl in her 30s and a lady in her 70s, the difference of opinion and <laughs> structure, yeah, you know. But anyway, between us, um, well, she's doing a great job. I shouldn't put it down to a job, Linda, you're just wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So, Sister Ethel, if you're ready, we'd love to invite anyone on the call to ask questions? Yeah, of course. Okay, if you ask a question, no, you can either to... type it in the chat feature, or you should see some icons um, that say yes, no, go slower, go faster. There's a button that's more. If you click that, there'll be like a little hand that's waving. That's how you can raise your hand, or since we can see most, literally just raise your hand, and we can unmute <laughs> to ask your question. Don't be shy now. Who's first? Karen. Okay, so Karen Price I've asked you to unmute yourself. You should see a little notice, and now you should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead, Karen. 
Good morning. I don't have a question. I'm just so overjoyed to see Linda and Sister Ethel in person and just want to thank you wonderful ladies of Missionville USA for everything you do and um, to Linda and Sister Ethel for everything they do. Um, Missionville is super, super close to my heart, I'm sure, like everybody else's and um, have my prayers and thoughts every day and not as much cash as I would like to share, but um, like you said, everybody's in this together. I just want to express my thanks and gratitude to everybody. Thank you, Karen. We really appreciate that. That's super. Anybody else? Oh, okay. I see Robert and Mary. Please go ahead. Sister Ethel, you mentioned that you had been in uh, South Africa for 48 years. Um, yeah. I didn't know that so many of those years were also spent in uh, Pretoria. How many years have you been in at Missionville? Almost 33, Mary. Yeah. And the other years I was, it was a different South Africa. I was, you know, when I came to Pretoria, it was very um, Afrikaans and the apartheid was really raging there. And I was, you know, very, very involved in it. And I was arrested twice because of my involvement. And uh, I had, you know, I had various experiences. Like it was... Um, it was a wonderful experience for me, but like not one I would have chosen had I known that should be my future. But um, yeah, um, yeah, it was just so totally different, so totally different. And um, maybe I'm not very proud of the outcome of it now, but a yes and a no, 50-50. But um, those were wonderful years, very challenging years. And um, I remember, uh, you know, during those years, as somebody said to me, um, he was um, a Dutch Reform minister, you know, um, and he said to me, he said, Ethel, aren't you ashamed of being white? And I said, no. I said, I love being who I am. And I said, whatever cover they put on me makes no difference. And I said, if I am white, I'm full of spots. I said, I don't know how you make white out of me, but I'm that, like, you know, recognized as that. And um, it was a great a channel being white in South Africa to build a bridge. And I like to think like that I was part of that. And it was only just be, you know, there a few months ago, I said to Linda, I must have done something because um, I was here in, in uh, Mission Vale, maybe about, um, what year was that? Nine. nine, yeah, yeah. Well then what have been in, in um, here in, um, in Mission Vale 20 years. And one day, these two big, strong men came down and they said they were looking for me. And I said, yes, this is me. And I said to this guy, I think I know you. And he said, you have every reason to know me. And he was one of the, of the um, officials in the police uh, force at the time. And he was really, really cruel to me. You know, when they arrested me, they made sure that my knees were bad. They would bang me off the back of it, you know, the, the toe bar of the van. And um, while the pain would go through you, I would say, well, just wipe it off and it's grand. But it's now I'm feeling the result of all that. But anyway, it was to give me what they call the Beobab Award for that. Linda, can you explain that? What the Beobab Award is? So the Beobab is a. Jane, you mentioned that you're battling to hear me. Is, is this better? Everybody can hear me, yeah. So the Baobab is a, a presidential award. Um, there's, there's only a limited amount given each year, and it is the top award that somebody in the country can get. Um, and and um, the Baobab is, I think, very significant. The Baobab is a, a typical African tree. If you Google Baobab tree, it's a nice, strong, sturdy tree. And I just love that since Ethel got the Baobab of all the awards, that it was the Baobab because many of you will know the history of Sister Ethel starting the care center under a tree, not a Baobab tree. We don't have them in the Eastern Cape, but, but a tree nonetheless. Um, and so it's, it's recognition by the president for, um, for work done in the country. Um, and so Sister Ethel was honored for that. Um, in fact, if you'll bear with me one second, I'll read the inscription on it. Um, it says, for her excellent service to society, 
caring for the vulnerable and poor members of her community. And so it was good to be white, you know, to build that bridge. And um, it was just a channel of um, making peace, fighting for justice, because as we all know, when there's justice, there's peace. So they, it was a big difference com compared to the poverty of Missionville now, even though I did have two outstations. I'm an arts by profession. And um, I had, um, you know, two outstations, one on a Tuesday and one on a Thursday. And um, they were great experiences too. Like, you know, I suppose in all our hearts, there's gratitude. And, um, you know, uh, they are in one of them, in a place called Makanyani. Um, the, the, the people used to gather around and they would, um, you know, tell me how, you know, I was, tell their, their stories about they being sick, how I had helped them and all that. So uh, then I would be given a hen to bring home with me. And there would be such a sermon about this hen, about all the, the eggs the, the hen would lay and all the chickens we would have and all the children that would be fed because of the eggs. And I had a little Volkswagen. And as soon as I turned down the, the engine of the Volkswagen, a hen would fly all around the place and they wouldn't let me tie the legs. So then of course, I would be waiting for the first place where I could stop to let out the hen, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, in fact, I have a bit of a mark there from a pic I got from one of them one time. But there were long, it was wonderful, you know, you really got into the heart of African life and it's rich and flourishing in culture. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Ernie, I ask you to unmute yourself. You should see a little. There you go. You got it. Go ahead. Sister Ethel and Linda, it is so special and wonderful to see you both. Yes. Oh, boy. oh, boy. Do you want to come into the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, could you update us a little bit about the size of Mission Vale now and the number of wonderful people that you are able to serve uh, through your nutrition program and just a little bit of a context of now where you're working and the overall uh, wonderful folks that you're able to to help. Yeah, um, well, the demographics of Mission Vale have changed and the last we'll say um, count that was done in, here in Mission Vale they said 35,000 people. But we know it's a way above and beyond that, Ernie, you know, because people still come in from the homelands seeking work in Port Elizabeth. And they come and they stay with relatives here. You know, just for instance, now I'll give you just this example. Um, and I suppose everything goes down to domestic experiences. Um, I was here one evening and I hadn't seen a particular lady for quite a while and I was concerned about her. So on the way home, I went to her home home and I knew that she had four children and herself. And so um, I said to her, I'm missing you. Are you all right? And she said, yes. She said, I saw you going down this morning and you must be very hungry. And I said, I am, you know. Now, this was about maybe five o'clock in the evening. And here she was with a half loaf of bread that she got from the center. And she was giving it out like this to her children. And I took the cover off the pot that she was making the soup. And it was just, you know, water with a few seeds on top of it because it had to go a long way. So anyway, she gave me my piece of bread and then she went to give me soup. And she said, you must meet the rest of my family. So out the back, it was a little, well, it wasn't a door really, it was just like a little snitch. I went out. And there, out of plastic and cardboard, were eight more people. Her uncle had come in with some of his family. Her sister had come, who, was, who had cancer and was attending the clinic. So all in all, she had 14 people in that home. Now, that is, like we just say, uh, it was a profound experience for me. Like a half loaf of bread, and she said, I get so much out of it doing, giving it out like this. And she gave me my piece of bread. You know, Ernie, 
I wasn't hungry for two days. I think it was the love with which she gave it and the heart that she gave it that fed my soul. Anyway, um, time and time again, we experience this. People can put a count on heads, but they can never count the ones that are hidden away. Just the obvious ones can be counted. But the ones that are hidden away and they're afraid to admit that they're there. And especially now at this time with the COVID virus, we are very concerned about that. Again, about the social distancing, which is impossible. In a home of four, it's not possible here in Mission Bay. When you have 14 and 18 people, and we have 18. So really, how to estimate it is beyond my mathematical um, um, ability. But that would be it. Now, I, I certainly would say myself that the hardest thing here at the center is doing what we, we try to do in the situation without any physical contact. You know, how many hugs would you give every day? And honestly, like people are broken, they're sad, they're sick, they're full of fear in the ordinary lives. There are people I don't have, but they don't scream that. I'm good at it. But they, they, they won't. I love the dignity with which they request what they really need. You know, but it's very difficult to like kind of, you know, people need to know I care for you. And it's not just by giving you something, you know, it's how you do it. And that has been really a plateau here in Mission Bay at the care center, uh, that we're not a service station. Whatever we do, we do it with that method of like kind of, it's not, it's how you do a thing, not what you give. It's how you give it. Like caring for people with terrible um, ulcers. And, you know, yeah, like I, I always remember, think of the day, I'm deviating from your question, but one example for me was the morning that Mother Teresa came um, to, to, you know, I was down at, you know, under the tree at the time, you know, and um, a man had been looking for work for a long time. And do you know where he was applied? I hope you're there. Uh, Bob, he was employed at GM. He got he got a job at GM, but he had a massive ulcer in his leg, and he had only come to me the morning before, and it was full of worms, and I had taken you know those old big brown wor um, mags of worms out of it. There I was. Mother Teresa arrives, and he came for the dressing. He had got a job which was fabulous, and um, you know. And Bob, I hope I'm not embarrassing you now, but how many people say to me, I just wish Bob Sosha was back. You know, what a wonderful managing director he was. But anyway, we have lost Bob to America. But anyway, uh, that morning when Mother Teresa came, so many people came around me and said, Ethel, Mother Teresa's waiting for you. And I said, but I said, this man has got a job. I have to do his dressing. Mother Teresa is here and she'll be gone in an hour. But this man is the father of children, and he'll be here for as long as God intends. And that morning, when I went out to meet Mother Teresa, there was a white maggot here on my, on my hand, and all I could do was this. I had no water, and that was it, journey. And like we say, the situation has grown out of that reality, you know, that um, it's one for one. Every person is so special. And every person must really get the love that God has put in our hearts for them. We have to express it. And that's been one of the, the dis disabling things during this uh, pandemic. You know, we're cut short. It's like as if your arms are really, you know, cut off. And it is very difficult. And when will we really be able to extend that care? You know, God alone knows. We're back to level one, as I said, at midnight tonight. And it's a threat to me. I don't know how you feel, Linda, about it. But, you know, people will have to respect it. Um, Ernie, I've forgotten what you asked me. <laughs> the, second, the second part, Sister Ethel, was, and Linda, was the nutrition program. 
your feeding program sort of on a daily basis. Uh, Still ongoing. An ongoing, what do you sort of the population that you are servicing and helping? Yeah, um, we'll say heads of family, you know, and those we count, and that's what I'm saying, you can count those, how many they're bringing it back to, we don't know. But it should be between the 700 and 800. It's okay. 900 now. 900. Yeah. And, um, and then with that, uh, we have the children, you know, yeah. at the school, which is 300. And they get their breakfast and they get a good sandwich as well. You know. So um, then... It doesn't stop at that journey. You know from your experience working in the kitchen that this one comes at 12 o'clock and another little bunch will come at half past 12 and one o'clock and so it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And Sister Ethel, I have to say, I, I think um, something that, that really touched Jen and I early on in this was the pictures that we saw from the care center and the you talk about the way you deliver the care. And this, I know this has always been a tenant with you is that it's about the dignity of the individual. And um, when we saw the photos of how you were organizing the chairs, uh, is it two meters, six feet apart, yeah. the outside yeah. of the, the church or the community center and the way, the orderly way that people were queuing for the, the soup and bread um, and that Bonita they were handing out the masks at that time and just all of that coming together the way the care center has responded in delivering the way it cares for the people the community it just was so touching and um, I think that's that's something that you know when we in the United States think about the way we've been challenged with this and this particular group of people on this call. There's something so special about this group of people because they take themselves out of their own situation and think more broadly and always consider in the backs of their minds and in their hearts, the people in the community of Mission Vale. And I just, I find it the core of human nature and the core of love. And I hope that we are serving as a great extension of what you're trying to do in the care center and the way you deliver care to people, the way that team has changed the way it delivers those services that we too are doing something in our communities and extending that to how much we care about the people in the Mission Vale community. So uh, to see the way people were queuing, the fact that you're continuing those services under such difficult circumstances to begin with is really just amazing and, and beautiful. So I don't know if you have any thoughts around that in, in the way you know we've seen the caregivers who go out for the home visits and the way that they've changed and the teachers delivering lessons to kids in, where they live in the community. It's just an incredible effort under normal circumstances, let alone the way you've had to change it to deal with the, the pandemic. Um, thank you for that, Sue. And I, I, you know, it's very hard to verbally express this. We would not be, I mean, you know that yourselves. We would not be able to do that if it wasn't for your monetary contributions. And um, for the love that we know that you have for us, you know, uh, it's not just solid um, money. It's, you know, it comes with so much care and so much determination that we will have it so that we can extend it into people and care for them. Um, you know, I had an experience there with a young guy not very long ago. Now, I, you know, it makes me smile. He came and he said to me, I'm so hungry. And, you know, it, it just happened. Everybody had gone, the staff had left, and I was here by myself. And to be honest, I don't have any key now for Mission Bay, you know. And it's good, maybe I'd lose it, but anyway, I don't have it. Maybe I did lose it, I don't know. But anyway, I literally had nothing. But I said, I promise you, I said, tomorrow morning, I will have a good food parcel for you. 
And he said, that's fine, he said, for tomorrow, but what about today's hunger, you know? And honestly, that really has taught me such a lesson, you know? And like, kind of, again, I just felt, you know, I, I, I had no access to anything, but look, at, I don't live very far from here. And he came with me home and I was able to care, as he said, for today's hunger. I was addressing tomorrow's hunger. But we would not be able to do it, and I really want you to know that, if it was not for your goodness and your generosity. And like the flesh and blood that you put into it. And I often say this to Linda, you know, getting what we get from you. You get up in the morning to work and you share your salary with us. You know, um, for, to people you don't know, but you know them through us. And thank you again for that. And, um, you know, your trust and your love. And, you know, those emails that come and, um, ah, they're just great, you know. Yeah. Sister, I just we have a question from Nadia. Nadia, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and please go ahead with your question about the clinic. Hey, Sister Ethel. Hey, Linda. Hey, everyone. Hello, oh, Nadia. Hello. Oh. My daughter is here, so you might hear her talk as well. Oh, oh hey. is she beautiful. Oh. Um, anyway, I was curious about the medical clinic because that's where I spent a lot of time, how that's going, how it's been affected by COVID, and what kind of services are they offering now? Um, okay. Yeah, I'd love a little update. Sure. So the, the clinic, unfortunately, has been one of the hardest hit areas during this pandemic. Um, Nadia, you will remember Dr. Stromick that uh, volunteered here. Um, he is, is he 76 now? He's 75, yeah. 76. So, so he is high risk for a variety of reasons. Um, all of our pharmacists are 70 plus. Um, so when we hit our initial lockdown in March, uh, they took the decision to all stay away and all of our cases were referred to the clinic next door. Um, and our nurse did some, you, you remember Sister Annie, uh, she did some telephonic uh, consultations and uh, our carers when they went out. So in that time, people weren't allowed by law to come to the center anyway. Um, so what we did was our staff would go out into the community, properly protected obviously, but deliver food parcels and deliver the medication um, so, so we did that for, for quite some time. Dr. Strombeck has, has taken the decision to, to keep um, away until the end of this year, uh, returning next year. But the good news is that there is, I don't think, Nadia, you would have met Dr. Lochner. Um, she's a, a younger doctor. Um, she worked at a practice just in Utnek. For those of you that don't know, it's a, a little town just about 20 minutes from here. But she is able now to uh, volunteer here once a week. So, and she's much younger and has a wonderful heart for the community. Uh, so between her and um, she also does uh, part of the women's clinic. She's, she's highly qualified in obstetrics. So some of the patients are, are able to return to us at least for the moment once a week. She also has a dispensing license. So we're able to, to get the medication to the patients. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to reassess it in January next year. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from Peter. Where is he? There he is. There you go, Peter. If you can unmute yourself. Sure. Hi, Sister Ethel. How are you? Hello, Peter. Hello. A long time since I met you in Zimbabwe. <laughs> it's, been it's been 20 years since I saw you in Zimbabwe. You haven't changed wow. a bit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> I just I'm so thought, sadness I, you've experienced in your own life. Yeah. I remember, I remember when you were telling me the story in Zimbabwe about starting the mission there and with the matchbox and you did a collection of about two pennies and I was just so overwhelmed by that story that I still tell it today and, uh, and obviously that's grown much bigger and my hat's off to you and everybody here on the Zoom call. I want to know, um, what are your, the major challenges that you're dealing with today there in South Africa? You know, because of the situation with the lockdown, Peter, so many people have uh, lost their employment. It might be a very meager wage, you know, as domestic workers and gardeners, but, you know, they haven't been allowed to go to work and therefore there's no salary. And they have, uh, we'll say 99% of them have been let go without any income, you know. So, and that is like through no fault of their own, as we all know. So therefore our um, queue for nutrition 
has got huge. You know, up to 900 a day, you know. And um, yeah, I mean, look, we all know if you don't have food, you're prone to any illness. The children can't learn, people can't focus, and food is our biggest need right now. Um, it's feed, it, it, it would say food feeds the other things that we, we hunger for in life. Yeah. What about medicine or AIDS? Is that a big part of yeah. your... Yes, that would be part of it. That would be part of it. But the real need right now is food. And naturally, you know, um, when well, we're coming out of our winter now, you know, and um, um, it's the lack of everything here, you know, like kind of electricity and water. Now we're without water for about four days and we don't know when we'll get it back and then it's off again. And that, and um, it all goes into the suffrages of life that's here, you know, queuing at the tap for water. And uh, the pressure is so low that if you had to join the queue any day and stand beside it, you know, it's like it just drips your energy out of you to watch it. So like food and medicine, and it would be our greatest needs here, but food is our priority. Mm -hmm. I think I remember Sister Ethel, one of my favorite quotes from you that I recall is that in Mission Vale, food is medicine. Yes, that's right, it is, it is. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have a question for Sister Ethel? We've got a few minutes left. Do we see any hands? Oh, Diane. There you go. Unmute me. Oh, Ethel, it's so good to see you and Linda. I have a question. Um, I remember distinctly the beautiful music at the beautiful veil. Thinking as I watched all of those people sitting outside with so little and yet so grateful and all of a sudden they started singing and they were mm. singing together and I'll never it was beautiful and I would hope that even with the pandemic and 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 all that's gone on there's still that hope there and the music is it true it is true and maybe now could we, I think we could all sing together now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> love, love, love changes everything. Hands and faces, earth and sky. Love, love changes everything. How you live and how you die. Love can make the summer fly, or the night feel like a lifetime. Yes, love, love changes everything. How I tremble at your name. Nothing in this world can ever be the same. Wonderful. Thank you. That was, <laughs> that's it. That's what you have done for us. Wow. You have done everything. And if it wasn't for your love and your care that's put into money and for us to be able to get the food and medicine that we can for the people of Missionville, which is the healing remedy of Christ's love, we would not be able to do it. And thank you so, so much. I wish you could all be here in the boardroom. I give a big, big hug across the seas, the mountains. And God bless you and God bless your families. We pray and for you. whatever need you have down deep in your heart, may it be answered through ministers in his world. And um, I do believe like, that, that it comes in all forms. God be with you, and thank you for taking this time to be with us. Well, Sister Ethel, um, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to speak after that. Um, <laughs> that song is very, very special, especially to Jen and I. So um, I think that is uh, the perfect place to uh, call this meeting and 
boy, we weren't expecting a song, but we probably should have. And for all of you who may not know, I'm going to be a little bit braggadocious and say, on my last visit, I was inducted as an honorary member to the Mission Vale Care Center Choir. <laughs> 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 and I still have the certificate hanging on my wall, signed by Sister Ethel and Linda. <laughs> Your uniform is here, yes, Sue. It's hanging, ready for you. Thank you very much. Um, as Sister Ethel mentioned at the very beginning of the call, you will be hearing from us soon as we kick off our ninth annual Hope for the Holidays campaign. And uh, we just thank you all so very much for your time this morning. Jen, as our, our president, do you have any, uh, any closing comments? Just, um, I know that Lister, Sister Ethel loves to hear from all of you. So if you do want to contact her, you can contact her through email with the care center with Linda. If you have any questions for me, our information is out there as well. Please feel free to call or, or email or anything. We love to hear from you all the time and, and thank you for everything that you do. And Sister Ethel, this was such a special hour. We appreciate it. Jen and Sue, just before you close off there, it's from Mal P.E. West, Port Elizabeth West. We're still there for Mission Vale. I'm standing right next to, we're sitting right next to you, by the way, there. And uh, once again, just before you sign off, I'd like to thank you, uh, Mary and, and Bob uh, and Dan, for all the work that you've done. And thank you for the district grant for the water tank, water tanks, and that's ongoing. Work, a lot of work is being done, and we're looking forward to reporting back to you uh, in due course. Thanks. Thank you, thank you for coming in. Well, what is all that stuff hanging from your chin? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say that all the gray hairs that I get from those two ladies sitting next to me there, it's growing all over my face. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all very much. And uh, special thanks to our Mission Vale USA Board of Directors for your ongoing commitment. And, um, and to all of you, thank you for your generosity, your continued friendship and love for Mission Vale USA, which we know is really Mission Vale Care Center. So with that, uh, Sister Ethel, we may be twisting your arm to do this again sometime. So don't <laughs> if you get that request from us. You know, Jen, give her the... I'm going <laughs> to turn this into a big group hug, though. Big hug. That's right. Big group hug, everybody. Thank you all so much. And with that, we'll wish you all the best and uh, Godspeed. Everybody, please take care. And thank you for your time this morning. We'll end the call now. Very much appreciated. Love to you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.